Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're going to take an in-depth look at robotics and artificial intelligence in space with NASA's Trey Smith and Jose Benavides. But first, we look at a triple star system that may be home to an odd exoplanet. We ride along with the Pepe Colombo craft exploring Mercury, and we talk about what's coming to the night sky in October. Roughly 1,300 light years from Earth, uh, the triple star system GW Orionis is enshrouded in a trio of dusty rings several times larger than our solar system. Astronomers using the ALMA network of radio telescopes found this stellar system may also be home to a Jupiter-sized planet far from the center of this triplet of stars. If confirmed, this system would be by far the largest planetary system yet discovered. Pepe Colombo made its first close encounter with Mercury on the 1st of October, record recording black and white images of that rocky planet. The spacecraft will make nine close passes of Earth, Venus, and Mercury before arriving at Mercury for the final time entering orbit around that diminutive world in 2025. Once at its destination, this vehicle will split into a pair of orbiters managed by the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. October offers a wide range of views for amateur astronomers around the Northern Hemisphere. Look for Jupiter and Saturn shining brightly in the southeastern sky soon after sunset when they will be easy to find. The Draconid meteor shower arrives on 6th of October. Viewers might see 10 shooting stars per hour under the moon in the sky. The harvest moon arrives on the 20th of October which will likely wash out most of views of the Orionids meteor shower, which peaks the following evening. On the 25th, skilled observers have their best chance to see the swift-footed Mercury floating in the western sky just before dawn. Well-placed views of Venus come four days later on the 29th, when the eternally entrouted planet will illuminate the skies of the Southwest just after sunset. Here's wishing everyone out there clear skies. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Trey Smith and Jose Benavides about robots and artificial intelligence in space. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, 
We're happy to be joined by Jose Benavides. He is the facility project manager for the AstroBee. Uh, robots, adorable little things ador uh, aboard the ISS. And we're also going to be talking with Trey Smith, who is the Isaac project manager who helps make these things run. Welcome to the show, folks. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. So, Jose, first questions for you. Now, people at home um, might let's say, not, might not be familiar so much with, with AstroBees and what they are and what they do. Can you just give us a brief intro to, brief intro to AstroBees? Yeah, well, so uh, happy to do that. And uh, let me take advantage of that background behind you. Uh, you've got some great uh, imagery of AstroBee. Uh, and uh, you got the queen there on the right in green and honey uh, in yellow on, on the left there. Um, they each have a name, uh, and I suspect that's Bumble uh, b right behind you. And um, <laughs> and they are free-flying robots uh, that can fly around uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, that that is the the one-line description of, of what they are. Um, and uh, one of the big uh, purposes of them being on on ISS is to be a research facility uh, on ISS for uh, robotics for uh, different types of technologies that can benefit from a uh, free-flying uh, platform on, on ISS. That's fabulous. And, and I, I just have to say, you know, these things are just adorably cute. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know who, you know, thought, you know, you just, you just have to make these things look adorable, but, but kudos to them. Um, <laughs> now... <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, it, as it turns out, uh, there was uh, a fair amount of thought uh, put into Astrobee's design uh, uh, in terms of its um, interface and its looks, looks and feel. Um, that that went into its uh, skin, for example, the the colors, the uh, uh, the uh, logo, the different lines you see on the outside there, the eyes. Um, all those play into a lot of the human interface elements of Astrobee. And so it certainly wasn't by accident that they uh, looked the way they do. Wow. And, uh, and so, Trey, you, you know, a lot of people might be, many people are familiar with AI in their homes to, you know, play music, or, you know, turn on the lights, order cat food. Um, <laughs> just give us a look at what, at what Isaac is doing and how that is similar or different to the AI many people may be familiar with. Sure. Well, um, uh, NASA's future deep space missions will be operating at, at greatly increased distances from Earth. Uh, we may even have missions that are several minutes of light speed time delay away from Earth. So um, it's very hard um, for uh, mission controllers to um, tightly communicate with what's going on on the spacecraft. Um, and even if it's a human exploration mission, um, there may be times when there are no humans present. Uh, for example, um, you could have a Mars mission where um, you send the return vehicle and put it in Mars orbit well in advance of the crew going there because you want to be sure that they'll have a ride back. Um, but now you have an orbiting vehicle that's out there for years on its own um, and it may have maintenance issues. Um, and so we're very interested in um, having intravehicular robots, you know, robots that operate inside the vehicle that can help out with that kind of uh, caretaking. Um, and uh, because of this uh, very long communications delay, it's difficult for operators to micromanage every detail of what the robot is doing. And so it's very important to have some level of autonomy so the, the robot can make decisions on its own um, in order to complete its, its tasks. Right, and of course that's going to come in, it's going to be essential for the Lunar ga Gateway, isn't it, for the Artemis program? That's right. The, the Lunar Gateway has um, periods of what we call loss of signal when it's out of contact with the ground. Um, and so um, if there's some kind of a requirement for uh, like emergency response on board the vehicle, um, it may be very important to be able to do that completely on board the vehicle 
without needing to uh, be in touch with the ground operator. And Jose, as we look, um, you know, as we're starting to enter this age of, you know, robotic aid to camps, you know, taking care of our, you know, space stations and colonies of the future, um, how is Astro, are the Astro Bees something that you hope to continue building in the future, or is this just sort of the first model of what could be whole generations of robotic uh, systems? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, to begin with, Astro Bee is itself uh, an iteration of a previous free flying uh, system called Spheres. Um, Spheres was operated for over 10 years on the space station, and it was also a free-flying platform. And so we learned a lot from, from Spheres, first built by MIT and, and deployed on ISS. We learned a lot about how to operate that kind of uh, facility on ISS. So Astrobe is already an iteration uh, from that. And uh, Astrobe was designed to be very modular and upgradable. And so um, itself, it can... Uh, was designed to operate for many, many years at a time. And so we hope to operate as to be as is for uh, years to come on non-space station. Uh, that being said, uh, there's definitely room for improvement and iteration uh, beyond as to be, and in particular, looking at future uh, NASA spacecraft, as Trey was uh, referring to. Uh, there could be a more advanced versions of as to be uh, flying on Lunar Gateway or Mars or, or other uh, vehicles. It's great. You, why can't you... you um you know, mention the future of this, but can you give us, you have any sort of, can you give us a glimpse of what future versions of these, of these robots may be? Yeah, well, I think you and Trey kind of hit on one of the uh, bigger advancements of uh, these robots being more autonomous, more independent, and capable of doing more advanced tasks on their own uh, on the spacecraft. And so that's definitely a big area of research and development um, where these things will advance uh, in that direction. Another direction that we're looking at for the Isaac project is um, having multiple different types of robots uh, cooperating together. So um, Astrobe is in the class of, um, you know, you could call them mobile inspector robots, um, but there are also mobile manipulator robots that you can imagine walking hand over hand throughout the interior of a vehicle, um, but also having um, much greater dexterous manipulation capability. So they can do things like um, open and close hatches and look behind panels um, and um, unzip cargo bags and move uh, items around. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to get these different kinds of robots to work together. That's great. And as I understand it, um, one of the next um, one of the next goals is to try to get uh, automated transfers like between cargo vehicles and the ISS. Can you tell us uh, about some of the challenges you're facing trying to get to this next step and how you're overcoming them? Sure, that's right. So um, part of the concept of operations for Gateway um, is that you could have uncrewed cargo vehicles that visit the Gateway facility um, and uh, it would be really useful if robots could actually transfer the cargo from that visiting vehicle into the gateway and even have the visiting vehicle depart before astronauts arrive uh, because you don't want to waste the astronauts' time doing this sort of mundane, um, repetitive task. Um, and uh, you, you're right. So we've, we've looked at, um, for example, uh, automated task planning where um, you could, as a ground operator, you could say in one command, unload the cargo vehicle. Um, and then the automated planning system would break that down into a number of different tasks for the different robots um, and uh, supervise them through the execution. So the ground operator is, is now in a role of oversight, uh, just you know, watching for problems and helping to fix them. But um, if everything proceeds according to plan, they don't even have to do individual commands. Wow. Uh, that, is, that is so interesting. And so, Jose, how do you see Astrobees working into this, working with the Lunar Gateway and, and the next steps in, in this development? Yeah, so uh, Astrobee is the proving ground and the uh, demonstration platform on ISS 
for advancing exactly that technology. Um, as I said, Asbury was designed to be very modular, expandable, reprogrammable. And so it's got some advanced computing on board where we can uh, test out the same algorithms, the same uh, uh, automation, uh, uh, AI, even AI type uh, technologies on Asbury, on ISS, in, in what we consider a very risk tolerant environment. Uh, that's one of the big benefits of this kind of facility on uh, the space station is uh, we do have crew on ISS. Uh, we do have a very short delay with ISS. And so uh, we can afford to uh, test out new ideas, new algorithms, new technologies. Uh, and if something doesn't work as expected, we iterate and we, we get better at it. And so uh, ISS becomes a, a really great uh, proving ground for uh, developing and then demonstrating this kind of technology uh, before uh, deploying it in, in more critical applications in the future. Hmm. And I'd love to get an uh, opinion of either of you on this one, but I'd love to know what role science fiction may have played in the development of, of this technology. I, it has a, a, a lot of input. Uh, it's, I think it's a well-known uh, relationship where uh, science fiction uh, informs uh, science development, and then it goes the other way around, right, uh, where we see some really great concepts in science fiction that uh, were supported by uh, recent ideas of researchers and scientists. Um, and uh, just one example of that uh, was the one of the original um, uh, concepts that inspired Sears, uh, the previous incarnation of, of a free flyer on, on on uh, ISS, and uh, it's it's one of the uh, well-known stories that uh, it was that MIT professor who uh, showed um, a Star Wars uh, video clip of the uh, I think it was called Amiibo or a free-flying uh, 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 droid uh, that shoots lasers. That's Luke Skywalker, uh, where he tries to block it with a lightsaber, right. and uh, so it's a cl classic science fiction uh, clip of a free-flying omnidirectional. Uh, droid uh, in Star Wars, and so that really did inspire Spheres in its uh, development and deployment on space station for this kind of research on on space station. Um, and then, as far as uh, Astrobe, uh, of course, there there is plenty of inspiration from other uh, robotic uh, applications and in, uh, in science fiction. And um, uh, well, one of the uh, inspirations I took uh, was uh, if you remember the movie. Um, with uh, Robin Williams uh, and uh, Flubber, uh, where it's got a free a free flying uh, robot with a screen on it uh, that uh, interacts with uh, Robin Williams in that movie. Uh, it was certainly one of my inspirations as a free flying robot um, when uh, when supporting the Osprey development. But I don't know. Trey actually uh, also led that uh, development project, and uh, he might have some other uh, inputs. Well, I, I led the engineering side. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think um, there were a, a really wide variety of sort of design inspirations from different films. Um, and I, I think a, a little bit of the design DNA in Astrobe might relate to the WALL-E movie. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just to give an example of, of things that move the other direction, um, not Astrobe specifically, but um, in our group, the Intelligent Robotics Group at NASA Ames, uh, there are lots of different projects. Uh, one of them relates to um, what are what's called dynamic tensegrity structures. So basically, robots that are made of rods and cables, um, and sometimes look a little bit like sea urchins. Mm. Um, one of them uh, being called the super ball bot. Um, but um, it it seems that um, the uh, the book Seven Eves uh, by uh, Neil Stevenson. Uh, makes reference to something that's suspiciously a lot like uh, some of those structures. So that, that was really interesting for us to see. Uh, you know, I just, you know, I just, uh, I just have to ask, you know, you think you like ever tempted to just like put a little subroutine in these things so that someone, you know, comes in from a spacewalk and get answers with, I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave. <laughs> 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 well, I, I can certainly uh, speak to the fact that uh, uh, the crew on ISS does have a sense of humor uh, on on occasion, and uh, it, it wouldn't be the first time that they they joke around uh, uh, about different things. Um, uh, 
Uh, we, we, we did have an earlier generation of um, experimental rovers where when they ran into a problem, they would play a game over sound. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's fabulous. And so, Trey, you know, Isaac, you know, seems to me like Isaac can go and control a lot more. It seems like it has great potential to control other, other systems. Give us an idea of the expanse and what it can be used for. Uh, well, in other well, technology. Isaac is yeah. I, Isaac itself is a, a project that will last only a few years, but we're we're hoping that the technology we develop does sort of live on to to these future missions. Um, and uh, I agree, it's uh, almost any um, human exploration mission is going to have uh, some kind of vehicle or outpost that that needs uh, maintenance and. Uh, is likely to be uncrewed for long periods where, where the only things that you can do the maintenance with are robots. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we see uh, uh, it's a critical technology. So, hmm. And finally, um, where is the next step in the development, um, in the development of AstroBees, Isaac, and AI um, robots in space? Uh, either, either one of you? Uh, yeah, well, so uh, I think the next step is just uh, uh, demonstrating more advanced uh, technologies. Uh, as we were talking about uh, the kind of scenarios where something like Astrobe or other mobile uh, robots, uh, manipulators can be operating on, on Gateway and, and Mars spacecraft. Uh, we're going to need to demonstrate those on, on ISS. And so we, we are working with uh, about a dozen uh, users, both uh, inside NASA as, as uh, projects like Isaac, but also commercial industry and um, academia for other research using Astrobe, uh, themselves demonstrating uh, technologies uh, that are going to benefit NASA in the future. And then that's not only NASA, but also commercial industries. Uh, just one example of that is uh, we have a user um, uh, from uh, Bosch uh, who's developing uh, the kind of technologies they need for acoustic mapping of an environment that they intend on turning around and utilizing um, on ground-based applications. And so that's just a, another big example where there are commercial benefits and uh, a lot of benefits on the ground um, that, uh, that are also benefited by uh, these kinds of uh, ASHB uh, robotic applications. Um, and we're also looking forward to um, implementing uh, next generation robots for Gateway. Um, the existing Robonaut and Astrobe robots on the ISS um, haven't you know, yet hit the level of uh, reliability that we need uh, to operate for long periods without astronauts' presence. Um, so uh, we're, we're thinking about how to get there. Great. I'm sure you will. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, gentlemen. It was, it was wonderful talking with both of you. Real pleasure. Thank you. And that, yeah, thanks. Yeah, and that was Jose Benavides, Astrobe Facility Project Manager, and Trey Smith, Isaac Project Manager for NASA. Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly in your, into your homes with fun, informative interviews. Next week, we welcome NASA legend Homer Hickam to the show. We'll talk with the man who inspired the movie October Sky about his new book, don't blow yourself up. And we're also going to discuss space exploration, training astronauts, and teaching David Letterman how to scuba dive. Make sure to join us then. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of this show one day early, together with advanced viewings of our comics, jokes, and a whole lot more. And we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit 
the cosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. Go ahead, Tom. Share Remember, it. you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Mm-hmm.